Sacred Heart is proud to sponsor Pensacola Histories in recognition of the Daughters of Charity who brought their mission of care to Pensacola over 90 years ago. Hello and welcome to our stories about Pensacola, one of North America's oldest communities. You know, Pensacola has a story that goes back more than 450 years. And many of the incidents that make up that story began not here, but far away. And as we begin the story this morning, we're going to be talking about what we now call the first attempted settlement in North America, the story of Don Tristan de Luna and his expedition of 1559. Now, I have to tell you a little bit of a story about how all that began, at least locally. Back in 1949, a group of interested citizens here were most concerned about developing a, a visitor or tourist industry here in Pensacola. And they wanted something on which they could, well, to hang their hat. And they came upon the idea of utilizing Don Tristan de Luna, who unfortunately, though he was a, a major uh, historical figure five centuries ago, really had been largely forgotten. Well, they knew that D Don Tristan had come here in 1559. And so the Pensacola idea was to create an annual event which would tell his story and, of course, attract people as they came to Pensacola and enjoy all that we had to offer. And so they came up with the idea of an annual program that would be staged in the early part of the summer, which they then called the Fiesta of Five Flags. And the, the concept was to have Tristan de Luna return each summer and to tell the story. And all of this was building up to the a celebration of our 400th birthday, which would come, of course, in 1959. And all this progressed very nicely from year to year to year Don Tristan re re returned, and by the time we reached 1959, we were ready for our quadricentennial, the first such celebration in all of North America. And that was what we had. It was, a, it was well, relatively speaking, a, a small World's Fair of history, which was all put together on Santa Rosa Island and was most successful. Well, this story, of course, then began to, to enlarge itself. And what we want to tell you today is the story of Don Tristan and who he was and how he happened to come here uh, more than 450 years ago. We have to take you back, of course, a little bit before his time to the days of Christopher Columbus. Uh, Columbus, as all of you will remember, uh, made four voyages to the Western Hemisphere, the last of which uh, saw him not only covering part of the Caribbean, but also the eastern shore of Mexico. But Columbus, of course, began his work, not because he wanted to come, but because some half century earlier, the Tur Ottoman Turks had captured the city of Constantinople and literally had cut it off, cut off the trade with the Spice Islands and India, which had become so important to people in Western Europe. They wanted, the, the people of Spain and Portugal ventured forth, their explorers managed to round the, the Cape of Good Hope. They, they, had, they knew where all of these things were, but it was a terribly long, torturous voyage. And so Christopher Columbus was one of several who came with the idea that there must be a, a shorter way. And that shorter way was to sail west and of course, as you will remember from your stu studies in, in all of your grades, Christopher Columbus in 1492 set sail, and he did indeed find a shorter route into the Caribbean. Well, Columbus made four voyages, and on the second voyage, one of his sailors, one of the men who accompanied him, was named Juan Ponce de Leon. Juan Ponce de Leon was a most successful gentleman with, uh, with Columbus, and shortly thereafter, when the Spanish government began to establish what we would today call a plantation economy in the Caribbean, uh, Ponce de Leon was one of those selected, and he became the governor of Puerto Rico. And he had a most successful tenure. But by the time, by the time we reached 1512, this is roughly 10 years after his uh, tenure began on Puerto Rico, Ponce de Leon retired. He was bored. He didn't know what to do next. And by now, he had begun to hear stories about what the Indians told of a great land that was further west and which they called the land of flowers. And Ponce de Leon turned to his king and said, look, I, I have time, I have money, I have resources. I would like to put together an expedition and go to this land of flowers, see what it's like, and if possible, create a new Spanish colony there. And the king said, fine, if you, at your cost, if you're willing to do that, let's do it. And so in 1513, Ponce de Leon set sail, and indeed, he landed about where, uh, about where uh, uh, Jacksonville is today. He, he put down roots, he did a little exploring, and then he went a little bit south, uh, hoping, of course, all the time that he was going to find another Indian civilization that, was, had, that brought wealth and gold and uh, new opportunities, but he did not succeed. He went back to Spain and, and waited six years, rebuilt his, his fortune, and again in 1519, adventured forth for a 
second voyage. And this time he went clear around the, the Keys, came up and uh, entered the bay at what we today call Tampa Bay. Now, unfortunately, the, the Chamber of Commerce had not gotten to the Indian tribes there. They did not welcome uh, Ponce de Leon with open arms. In fact, they fought him. Uh, Ponce de Leon was injured, he was wounded, and he died of his, uh, of his injuries. And of course, the expedition then folded and went back. And that was the last that we saw of, of uh, a venture of that kind for several years. Meanwhile, in that same year, 1519, a second explorer, this one named Francisco Elian had again come to about where Ponce de Leon had landed at first, in the St. John's River area. But this time, this gentleman moved north, and he had quite a number of uh, people with him, hoping that perhaps he would be able to plant a colony. And he moved north about to oh, where Cape Hatteras is today. Uh, they had many misadventures there. The col colonial idea did not come forth. And uh, uh, Elian returned to Spain. But the one thing that he pointed out to him was, if in the future, Spain wishes to plant a colony here on the east coast of this new landmass. Here is a fine place to do it. And that a note was made of that, that the Cape Hatteras area might be it. In that same year, 1519, Hernando Cortez, again an adventurer, explorer, landed with his force on the east coast of Mexico. They advanced inland, they confronted the Aztec Empire and defeated their soldiers, and Mexico then became a Spanish province. And over the next few years, with Cortez as the leader, the, the, the Spanish uh, uh, settlement there mushroomed around Mexico City, and this became the largest current uh, Spanish enclave in the New World. Okay, we move forward just a few years to the year 1528. In this year, still another explorer decided he would like to become the governor of La Florida. He, he had heard what had happened to uh, Ponce de Leon. He felt he might do better. And so he set forth uh, in this year with a, a force of about 200 men, many of them cavalry. And they were guided by a rather unusual map. And this map, this map which we're showing you right now, is called the Cantino Map. Now, we don't know quite where it came from. It may have been drawn by the son of John Cabot, the English explorer. The, the, uh, John's uh, so, uh, son was named Sebastian. And this, this Cantino Map may have been his, but we're not sure. But the important thing is that it showed, as you can see in the map, it showed the, the contour of Florida and also some distance to the, east, to the west. And that is important in, our, in the story of the explorer uh, 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 Panfilo de Narvez. Narvez explorers landed and their, their plan was to land at, on the east side to march north into what we today call Georgia and explore further, again expecting to find a rich Indian civilization. However, they made arrangements for if they should fail, they should be picked up at a place on, the, on what we today call the Gulf of Mexico side. And this, of course, is what was shown to them in the Cantino map, the map about where, where St. Mark's, Florida is today. And so Panfilo de Narvez and his people moved north. They, they marched for about six months, and they found absolutely nothing. And so at this point in time, they turned around, marched south again, and again came to the point at St. Mark's where they were to be picked up by a relief expedition. Well, they got there and nothing happened. The, the, the ships didn't, didn't show up. And after waiting several weeks and being confronted by hostile Indians and running out of food, they decided that they had to get back somewhere. And they, they, had, they had three choices. One was to, to wait, and that, of course, did not look like a very good choice. The second was to try and walk to Mexico, because by now, of course, Cortez and his work was known, and they knew that they probably could walk clear along the coast and go, go then south to Mexico City. Bear in mind, of course, there was no uh, Interstate 10 then, no Michelin Guide, no McDonald's along the way. This was a, a, a march through uncharted territory, but they decided this was one option. The third option was to try and build small vessels or barges on which they could yeah, place portions of their group. And by the way, there were about 200 of these people, so they, they decided that's what they would do with, with the minimal tools that they had with them. Well, they set to work, they hammered and they sawed, they built five little barges, and on a given August afternoon, they set sail. They've moved out, and of course, all of us who live along the Gulf Coast appreciate what can happen in August. A, a storm brewed very quickly, four of the barges quickly sank. And the fifth one, the people on the fifth one quickly rowed back, got to the shoreline, and were saved. And they now chose a new leader. And this man was, his name, his real, true, true name was Alvar Nunez, but history calls him by a different title. He is known
known as Cabeza de Vaca, the head of the cow. And Cabeza de Vaca pulled the group together and they said, all right, our next choice is we must march west. And indeed, that's what they decided to do. Well, over the next month and a half or so, these men suffered all sorts of difficulties. They were captured once by a hostile uh, Native American group, but they finally staggered along and got as far as Pensacola Bay. Here, uh, it's surprising that they would risk this after their previous misadventure, but they said, we'll, we'll put together a raft and we'll row ourselves across the bay. And this poor, de de bedraggled, starving group of men reached the east side of the bay and there they encountered another Indian tribe. However, these folks were peaceful and they, they were not Pensacolians. They were here on vacation literally having a good time right along the Gulf. And so the, 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 the Indians befriended them, they, they moved together, for, and, they, and the, the Spaniards stayed about a month. And during that time, Cabeza de Vaca uh, made many friends among the Indians. He, he, he got a good look at what the area was like. He, he made a, a mental map of what he saw. And basically when the, uh, when the time was right, even though some of the younger, uh, younger Spaniards thought, well, maybe we, we, had, we don't know what's on the road to the West. Maybe we ought to stay here. These young Indian maidens are very attractive, but the Cabeza de Vaca ruled with an iron hand. They marched west. And the long and the short of the story, or his story rather, is that over the next seven years, all but two members of that group died. They were either captured, wounded, died in, uh, by uh, injury or malnutrition. But after seven years, uh, Cabeza de Vaca did return safely, or did get safely, to Mexico City. And the important part of our story is that his, sto his story, his, his concept, and his mental map of what he saw here was referred to the Mexican archives there with the story that if Spain ever wants to put a colony here on the Gulf of Mexico, this is the perfect place. The bay is beautiful. The Indians are friendly. This is where we should go. And that ended basically the story of uh, our friend uh, Cabe Cabeza de Vaca. About, about 15 years later, still another uh, leader, another conquistador, began his move into the Florida, Georgia, Alabama air, area, and his name was Hernando de Soto. De Soto marched, landed in basically Pensacola, in uh, Tampa Bay. He and his force marched north through Florida into Georgia, and then turned west, and by, by the time we got to, uh, to the middle of the winter, or close to the middle of the winter, they had run out of food, and their opportunity, they, things were just not going well at all. But now, what, like, like like uh, Narvez, our friend uh, De Soto had made arrangements for his whole expedition to be rescued, to be picked up at the place where Cabeza de Vaca had made his little map here at what we now call Pensacola. And uh, De Soto's force was to come here and be picked up and rescued. Well, of course, by the time he reached uh, the center of, of Alabama, or what we now call Alabama, things were not going well. But he did have one wonderful discovery. He, they bumped, literally bumped into a huge Indian civilization there in the middle of that area called the Coosa tribe. And the Coosa tribe was large. It had a, a big central area of, uh, of good many hundreds of people. And they also had a number of satellite villages scattered around, oh, 50, 100, 150 miles distant where that were related. And, they, and of course, they were little farm villages as well. Well, De Soto's plan was just to, was to push on as far as he could, but ultimately, uh, he, he recognized that he had discovered nothing while he was at Coosa, so instead of coming south to be rescued as, he, as the plan called for, he pushed west. Well, of course, as, as those who studied history know, he ultimately found what we now call the Mississippi River. He crossed over, and unfortunately there, he and many of his men were killed. But some did succeed in getting back to Mexico, right, walking to Mexico as Cabeza de Vaca had done, and they told their story of Coosa and what they had seen. Meanwhile, the man who was to have picked the, the fleet, the fleet leader who was to picked up our friend uh, De Soto and his people, arrived at Pensacola. His name was Diego Maldonado. He looked, he mapped, he saw, and after about a month, he realized that De Soto was not coming, and he in turn returned home with his view, his mapping of what he had seen here along the Gulf. So now we had had Cabeza de Vaca and now Maldonado, all both at what we now call Pensacola, looking at what they had seen and preparing the way for what might happen later. And of course, at this point, they do, did not know what it might be. But for the next stage of our story, you must tune in at our, uh, our next episode, which will cover the next stage of Spanish exploration.